Hello, welcome to Enlightening. Today we're here with Vicente Jimenez, who's going to teach us about Falco. I'm so excited to have you here, Vicente. Uh, tell us about yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm really excited to end, by the way, very well pronounced my name. I know it's very difficult for foreigners. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> a little bit about me. I'm a systems engineer. That's how I started. I used to work in in a big telco company, a Spanish big te telco company. And mm -hmm. I was traveling a lot in Latin America. I was deploying clusters, bare metal clusters. Back in the days, everything by hand, everything manual. And like five years ago, I started into the Kubernetes world. So I uh -huh. discovered the automation of deploying containers. Ah. I started to work as an instructor for for the company Red Hat. So, so I was teaching Linux. Yeah. And a special like a special appreciation for the problem that Kubernetes solved, because you were in there in the trenches with the problem. Yeah. Every yeah. time we deployed a cluster, it took us like two months. We were deploying everything from hardware to the application, configuring, testing with the customer. There was a lot wow. of scripting. And that's well, a, a Kubernetes cluster? No, uh, I'm talking like 15 years ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the virtualization was more like you have a Solaris machine and you create a domain. <laughs> it was very different to, to nowadays. I'm, I'm new enough where I only ever hear the, the term cluster in the context of Kubernetes. So when you say oh. cluster, I, I, that's, I don't even know what other kinds of clusters are well, out there. It, it was more like three levels of machines where one okay. level are eight machines having a database. Then you had another mm -hmm. level with 10 logic backends. And then you had the front ends that were connected to the, to the telco interface. So okay. it was, and then you had a disaster recovery and backups and well, it was. So when you wanted to deploy an application, it would take two months just to, to do it. It could take one, two days to, to do it because you had okay. to copy the, the the binaries, then you have to change the configuration. We are talking bare metal here. So uh -huh. everything was very slow and uh -huh. every little change could, could make the, the process to stop. And that could even make a, a reaction. So I, I remember once we had like 100 servers out of service because wow. the the logic was restarted and all the, the front end servers were like, I don't find the, the endpoint and they all shut down. That, wow. was, that was critical. Do you feel like having that experience and that like, like knowledge of what's really happening? Um, do you feel like that serves you now that the abstraction layers are so many abstraction layers happening now on top of that? Now the abstraction layers are different. It's uh -huh. more like they take care of it. And uh -huh. if you don't understand what is happening, you don't know where to look for the problem. Yeah. So now it's more like I have a deployment that has a replica set. There is a pod and the pod has containers. And eventually mm -hmm. you end up having so many processes, so many containers. You don't know where mm -hmm. nothing is running. So it's mm -hmm. very difficult to, to monitor that infrastructure. And do you think your, that deep infrastructure knowledge you have from 15 years ago helps you? Yeah, it does help. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I wish I had known what I know now when I was deploying those clusters. <laughs> that's that's the story of life in general. I mean, there's a song, right? I wish I knew what I know now when I was younger. <laughs> yeah. Just about a lot of things. Yeah. I'll sing for you. Um, Nick's here. Hello, Nick, the first one. Thanks so much for joining. I love it. Love it. Love it when you're here, friend. Um, uh, so I feel like I interrupted your story because I wanted to ask more about infrastructure and in the term cluster applying to something. Yeah, I, I was just Kubernetes. I was telling how I started in the Kubernetes world. So yeah. that was uh, thanks to the company Red Hat. I discovered OpenShift, and the first time I was working with that was like, okay, this is too much. What is this thing doing? I didn't know mm -hmm. Kubernetes yet, and I was learning oh, OpenShift, yeah. and ah. that was kind of okay. Uh, Red Hat adds a lot of functionality that makes mm -hmm. your life easier mm -hmm. when you know what you have to do. The problem mm -hmm. is I, I was supposed to use a platform and I didn't know what was happening behind the scenes. Uh -huh. And I tend to be a person I really like to know how things work. Me too. So just mm -hmm. clicking the button and something magic happens, that's not my style. <laughs> I, I can't really frustrate it. 
<laughs> I feel well, you. Uh-huh. That, that's how I learned Kubernetes. And I was always interested in security. So uh-huh. that's why one and a half year ago, I moved to a company called Cystic. Mm-hmm. And Cystic are the creators of the Falco project. Falco cool. project, a few years after it was created, was donated to the CNCF. Now it's an incubating project and has a very thriving community. It monitors your infrastructure. I said before, it's very difficult to monitor so many containers. Uh-huh. But Falco does a very good job at that. Excellent. Well, with that, maybe once you start talking about the tech, I feel like I need to get behind the light board so I can so I can capture everything you're saying. This is gold. <laughs> that was um, too much information. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I just need to write it down. <laughs> um, so one thing, oh, let me put in the text right now in the chat. I'm going to put a link to the Falco uh, docs so y'all can jump in there. Um, and then... Why don't one thing we talked about up top, like before the show started, is that you're living that digital nomad life. And actually, yeah. we we talked to a guest, Peter, about digital nomad life, um, but he lives in Denver and he did it like U.S. in a van kind of style. Mm-hmm. But you apparently you're you're doing like a co living digital yeah. nomad situation. Yeah, tell tell me exactly. Everything. I used to yeah. have a I used to have a partner where I was working for Red Hat, and he was an uh-huh. instructor. So he was in the van, living in the van, driving to every city, and teaching from well locally, but just yes, uh, living in the van. And my situation was a bit different. Uh-huh. So I used to teach in the customers' premises, uh-huh. and that was kind of the way was uh, the job. So when the pandemic started, I had to do it the same. I had to do the same, but from home. And after, I think it was like one and a half year, I didn't go anywhere. I was just sitting at home, teaching people online, talking basically to the monitor, trying to get some feedback on the headsets. And my partner said, why don't we go to Portugal? And I was like, Portugal? yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, I know there's this uh, in the south of Portugal, there is a, a very nice city, very small, and we could spend there like a month. Okay, sounds good. So, should we take vacation? Well, maybe you can continue working from there. And we did it. So, we went to, to the south of Portugal, to Lagos. We stayed eventually like four months, and we had a, an amazing time. So, I was working during the week, the weekends were off. And I feel like I didn't need to take vacations. So mm-hmm. a year after, we did the same, but go into the Canary Island. And in the Canary Island, there is an amazing co-living. For those that don't know it, a co-living is like a house, could be a, a villa, where a lot of digital nomads, they go, uh-huh. they go there for a week, two, three, sometime half a year. And there is a co-working space, there's a shared kitchen, there is a big living room. So people live together, they share experiences. If they have any issue, well, they just discuss it in the evening. They do a lot of activities on the weekend. And Fun. it could be seen as a hostel, but it's uh-huh. much more. So it's like a hostel with networking opportunities. You get to know a lot of people that have similar affinities or maybe totally contrary, and you learn something that you never expected. I think I learned once a guy that knew how to make beer. And uh-huh. oh. there is this skill share every, every week where people say, well, now I'm going to talk about cybersecurity, or now I'm going to talk about how to make cheese, how to make beer, or stuff like that. It's mm-hmm. really a, a great opportunity to meet new people, to see what is beyond beyond those walls in your house. What skills from that do you still use today? Um, Well, I love cooking. So Mm -hmm. we used to cook a lot in in the evening. There was shark cooking, sometimes was Moroccan cooking, sometimes was Asian cooking. Um, Myself, I love doing Indian cooking. So every time I do a curry, it's like three hours. I usually I usually ask for a couple of people to to help me because it's a lot of cutting, chopping, and and 
cooking time itself, boiling, um, frying. So spending yeah. time with people while doing that is really enjoyable because you get to to talk and discuss and you learn a lot during that time as well. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so it sounds like when you were first starting a digital nomad life, you, there wasn't even a name for it yet. You're just like, I don't, I'm tired of sitting here. Let's move around. Well, um, I realized that I was being a digital nomad 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So when I was working for this telco company, I spent three years living in Latin America. So yeah. the company was sending me to a country. I spent like six months in a, in, uh -huh. in a country. And then I was coming back home. I spent like three uh -huh. weeks a month and I was going to another country. Everything paid by the company. So it was quite cool. And yeah. Then, and then I, there wasn't a name for digital nomadism, not yet. Mm -hmm. But then when it became a, like a thing, it was like, yeah, I was doing that 15 years ago. Now it's more uh -huh. like there is a network. There are people doing that. You can connect with them. You can share experiences and eventually see how things work in other countries. We have some comments in the chats. We have a Shabam says a curry should never take three hours. So them fighting words. Or so... <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe he, maybe it's because he's not cooking. <laughs> <laughs> he, that's true. Or maybe uh, the vegetables are prepped. Maybe it's like the TV show style cooking where the onions like already chopped. They're all chopped vegetables and and that, um, you know? Yeah, I, I remember my first curries were taking really long. Now I think I can... I can bring the time down to 45 minutes, one hour. But if you start from the very beginning, like chopping everything and the uh -huh. cooking process is usually slow yeah. because you want to release all the flavor from the spices, uh -huh. less than one and a half hours is, is very difficult. <laughs> uh, Fuel Snobble's here. Hello, Fuel Snobble. Fuel Snobble says, Falco, I think I've seen mentioned in other places I worked. Um, mm -hmm. How long has Falco been around? Falco's been around for five, six years. Mm -hmm. So it started as a process, well, process monitoring tool. Okay, let, let me let me recap here. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, one thing I want to capture on the board while you're you seem to naturally be going in this direction is like, what was the world like before Falco existed? Like, what problem was okay. happening that where so, someone said we need Falco? So, yeah. so here's the thing: when mm -hmm. when a process is running. We don't know what's happening behind the scenes, but we have tools for that, right? We have very old tools like Strace, Cell Trace, that are able to tell you what libraries are doing, what the, what the kernel is doing. We have tools like LSOF to list the number of, uh, to list the open files in the system. We have mm -hmm. very cool tools like Wireshark, which is kind of related to Falco. I'll, I'll explain that later. And those tools are able to tell you a little bit of what happens in your system. So a person in Cystic had the idea of creating a tool that combined all that information, not okay. only observing one specific aspect of the process, but also mm -hmm. observing the state. So when you start a process, there is a parent, there is a set of open files, there is a set of network connections, and that kind of keeps the, the whole state of that process. Um, will you repeat the thing? So tools existed to monitor open files? Yeah, there are tools like LSOF, like Strace, like LTrace, like TCP dump. Um, when you say, uh, what's, what does Strace do? Strace is able to see the system calls that the process that the binary is doing. So okay. I can I can run it together with the process and then I will uh -huh. see the activity at a very low level. So okay. I can observe as if I were a machine, I could observe, well, it's trying to open a file, it's trying to um, create a socket or it's trying to get some memory and that kind of kernel information. Okay. So and what was the, the third tool, third the third, tool you mentioned? Um, mm -hmm. TCP dump, for instance, TCP dump is able to observe the traffic, the network traffic. Okay. So 
So what, so someone was said, okay, we can have one tool that does all of these things. Exactly. So they created a tool called Cystic and it's what we call nowadays Cystic open source because there's okay. a company with the name Cystic. Uh -huh. And the name of the company was uh, different before when they created this tool. So that tool, that Cystic tool, was able to interactively show you all the system calls that were open, show you the network connections that were initiated, showing you the, the state of those processes. So it was a tool created to do troubleshooting and monitoring when something was off, right? So sometimes we need tools to debug what happens in the system. And Cystic was a very good, is still a very good tool for that. S-Y-S-D-I-G? S-Y-S-D-I-G, exactly. Oh, like okay. system digging. Oh, got it. Because when you use three separate tools, it's maybe it's hard to compare and could like see where those, there's some places where these things intersect. And so yeah. if you use one tool, you can see how these um, symptoms are comparing to one another exactly. or relating and to those one another. Tools, those tools are either showing you what happens in the moment or is taking a snapshot uh -huh. of what happened at a specific moment in the past. But none uh -huh. of those tools were keeping kind of the, the state, the context of why something mm -hmm. happened. So Cystic was taking the functionality from those tools and a bit more and was showing you the current state of the system, so to say. So mm -hmm. everything that happened in the system was being displayed in your screen. So that's a lot of information. We need to mm -hmm. be able to filter that. We, we need to be able to say, um, I just need the information from this process or I uh -huh. need the information for this network connection. And like TCP dump, we are able to set filters. So in TCP uh -huh. dump, I could say, I want all the traffic that comes from a specific IP address or that has to do with a specific protocol. And we have a filter, we can create complex filters with ands, ors, and so on and so forth. So Cystic used the same system. Mm -hmm. It was able to receive those filters in the command line. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to troubleshoot a process that was doing weird network connections, I just needed to indicate, okay, show everything that has to do with this process ID. Mm -hmm. And maybe I need to filter down later. Maybe I need to be more generic. I think it's very interactive. And that uh -huh. was giving me very useful information for troubleshooting. Uh -huh. We have some comments from Fuel Snowball. Uh, they say, I suppose you should just send the straight to chat GPT these days and ask it if something's weird. <laughs> but viruses and malware is impossible on Linux, I have been told. No, it's not impossible. There are there are many there are many viruses, many Trojans, a lot of malware that can run in Linux. It's a bit more difficult to get privilege escalation, but nothing impossible. So I like it. Many bugs around. Okay. So we're learning about these uh, singular tools. We're learning about combining them with Sysdig, mm -hmm. but we, we're getting to Falco. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So as I said, Sysdig was a very interactive tool. And mm -hmm. I was able to set filters to eventually find something that was off and gave me a clue of how, how I could fix it. Now, mm -hmm. if I could somehow let Run, a cystic running in the background mm -hmm. with a set of filters and every time there is a match just imagine it's, it's like a bingo uh, mm -hmm. in a bingo you are hearing numbers and suddenly you have the whole car full and you get a prize right mm -hmm. so every set of filters that were passed to to cystic could be a match mm -hmm. well that's actually falco falco was is able to run as a daemon, is able mm -hmm. to constantly look for events, and it has a set of rules. So those rules are a set of conditions. Mm -hmm. As an example, there is a container that is trying to start a shell, 
and the container image is not one of these three that are in an allow list. Mm -hmm. If those conditions are match, then Falco triggers an alert. Mm -hmm. So what Falco did was to automate what Sysdiv was doing in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And this is how it has become a very useful monitoring tool. So that's a bit from the history point of view. Yeah, this is great. So Falco is created, to, it runs in the background as a daemon and automates the way Sysdig applies filters. So I like, I, um, yeah, we, we I don't, imagine. We don't yeah. mention Sysdig nowadays anymore because Falco yeah. was donated to the CNCF and it's a project that is independent from the company Sysdig. But, uh -huh. and this is the bad, they use the same libraries. So inside okay. them, they have the same functionality at a certain level. Mm -hmm. Of course, Sysdig is not the only project that uses Falco libraries. But the moment Sysdig donated Falco to the CNCF, it also donated those libraries, but kept using them. So it was a great way to share with the community um, an amazing functionality that Nowadays, it's used in projects like Stack Rocks, like in GitLab Package Hunter, and many others. Um, great. So I just added Falco still uses Sysdig libraries, but all donated to CNCF. And we call them Falco libraries. <laughs> it's a minor detail. Um, okay, so what I'd like, this is great. What I'd like to capture next, if it works for your, your idea of how the story should go, is just simply um, a definition of Fal Falco. Falco is... Mm -hmm. Falco, Falco is a... We define it as a security camera. Mm -hmm. like a sensor, like a, um, a motion sensor. So imagine that we are trying to monitor an amusement park. Mm -hmm. So this is a comparison we use a lot. Before, uh -huh. our infrastructure was more like a castle with a firewall and everything was well-defined, well-protected. Now it's uh -huh. like everything run, you don't know where, as I said, uh, it, there are uh -huh. a lot of containers, a lot of processes, and it's very difficult to monitor all of them at once. So we compare it with an amusement park, and then we have mm -hmm. security camera that are able to recognize anomalous behavior. Mm. What's an anomalous behavior? Opening files that you shouldn't open, created connections you shouldn't create, starting processes where you shouldn't start them. So that kind of behavior is constantly monitored. I love and, that. And the I moment something analogy. happens, uh -huh. then Falco tells you, hey, something happened here. Uh, uh -huh. Just let you know, I'm gonna keep monitoring. That's nothing more. Uh -huh. Just tell you. I love you. that. Because it's like a, a, a roller coaster is an application and it has users on that application and users waiting. And yeah, it's great. I love that analogy. Yeah. And, and one system has a lot of different applications running and it captures the complexity. What, exactly. what fr and, <laughs> fried food? And the are thing you is, eat? the the activity yeah. doesn't need to come only from people. It could come uh -huh. from an attraction. Let's say there is a fire. Let's uh -huh. say there is uh, something malfunctioning. Uh -huh. So Falco has the capability of gathering information from different sources of events. Yeah. So, as I was displaying, uh, explain now, we were talking only about syscalls, but nowadays uh -huh. we can gather information from Cloud Trail, from Kubernetes, from anything you want, if uh -huh. we have the plugin or if you want to create the plugin. Mm -hmm. So we are able to extend that to a very varied set of sources. I love it. I, but I, I still want like a, a technical definition of Falco. And I'll, okay. my, yeah. So Falco is a threat detector. Okay. which is cloud native. Mm -hmm. And that means that it's able to give you information about 
the activity that happens in a container is not exclusive to cloud native, but is cloud native. Is it that yeah. simple? Usually yeah. they're, they're longer than that. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, I'm going to get it all in one line, though. Um, how is how is this related to uh, policy tools? I guess it's just a whole different thing. So this is like doing like runtime. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How does it know what a thread is? Is I guess is the question. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, it's a bit like um, playing bingo, right? So imagine uh -huh. you go to a bingo and you are given a card and you have to write the 25 numbers, 25, 35, I don't know how many they are. Yeah. You have to write them yourself before you start the game. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's not random. It's like, okay, now try to guess which numbers you are going to you are going to get. Well, uh -huh. what we do is we define what kind of activity shouldn't happen. And when it happens, is when we call it a threat. So as I said, we observe system calls. So imagine a system call that tries to open a file. Mm -hmm. The name of the file is ETC shadow, where the passwords are stored. OK. Well, pretty simple. We already have one rule, right? Uh -huh. Of course, it could be more complicated. Um, maybe we have a process that keeps doing that all the time. Then we can add an exception. That's another part of the condition. Then the rule is a bit more elaborated. And mm -hmm. the more general rule is, the more false positives we're going to have. And the more specific, mm -hmm. the more false negatives we're going to have. Uh -huh. so there is a set of rules that are uh -huh. provided already with Falco. There are like 70 rules uh -huh. and they are quite generic. I mean, they okay. don't have many false positives, but it's um, the user has the possibility to customize those rules, to write their own rules or to add exceptions to those rules. But a threat is defined as something that we don't want to happen. Mm -hmm. And we detect them by writing a rule that matches certain conditions. It's like that filter I was mentioning before. OK. You're, um, I'm still writing down about amusement parks. So you're way ahead of me, but I'm loving this. So, so. We we're talking about um, creating the policy and too uh, permissive versus too restrictive, and we're talking about the the you said seventy that are seventy about, rules by default. By default, and then so I want to capture all of that. I think that's really interesting. But then, like, um, are those seven? When you like install and run Falco. Are you like choosing which of those 70 to use? Or are those just like 70 best practice things? Um, that... Well, some of them are disabled. Okay. For instance, there is a rule that detects um, when the process or its container is doing mm -hmm. a connection to a crypto mining service. Mm -hmm. So we have a set of IP addresses. We have a set of ah. um, processes names. We have a set of rules that combine all that information, but by default is disabled. Maybe the user doesn't want to use that rule. The only thing they need to do is to enable that rule. So you said so you said earlier what a thread is. What's a, a threat? Threat. Uh -huh. a threat is an event that could endanger our system. And then, and then when what we do is we define a rule able to mm -hmm. recognize that event or set of events and trigger an alert. And that's what we call a Falco rule. Uh 
Um, so, okay. So I'm going to call it a threat event. Mm -hmm. And triggers an alert. A threatening event. <laughs> <laughs> Very scary. <laughs> And that's a Falco rule. Yeah, Falco rule is basically um, a condition. It has a name. It has an output that is usually templated because we want to provide information about what triggered the, the rule. And it also has a syslog priority and a few more fields that are optional. Um, so starting, you... it has a, a name that we use name. as an ID. Okay. It has a condition. Condition. It has okay. an output. Output. Is the output the alert? Uh, no, well, yeah, yeah. The output is a text message that could have variables. Okay. So that and a priority. Priority. Depending on the kind of threat, could be a warning, could be an error, could be um, more critical. So this is text and uh, priority, okay. And uh, a description. We also description. have a description for better user experience. How bad will be the priority? And, and this is a bit tricky. We also have something called macros and lists. So a macro uh -huh. is a set of conditions. Uh -huh. That means in a rule, we define conditions that could be grouped as a macro. OK. So a macro is not a part of a rule. A macro is a, okay. an external component that can mm -hmm. be used inside a rule. Okay. Let's. So, uh, yep. But let's. I want to. I want to press pause on that before, and make sure I have this before we move to the next thing, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a less plus more optional. That's stuff. the basic form of a rule. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about a threat and um, a threat event that triggers an alert. I want to, before we hop into um, the macro stuff, I was interested in capturing about the built-in Falco rules. We have a hello. I think this is a hello. I can't quite see the emoji, but let's just say it's a hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. I'm interested in, in writing out about the rules that come with Falco and, and how they're meant to be used. And actually, I'll say it's your call whether you, wanted, you want to talk about the rules or whether you want to talk about the macro um, stuff. I, I'm going to talk first about the both. macros. I'm going to, okay, to talk first. Good. So um, the conditions of a Falco rule can be very large. Mm -hmm. And the way to simplify those are creating macros. Okay. So if we have like 20 conditions and those from those 20 conditions, 10 of them can be used in several rules, what we do is we write those 10 conditions in a macro mm -hmm. and then we can simplify the Falco rule. So the number of conditions in a Falco rule can be very large. Yeah. And so we can uh, group them into macros to make them more easy to manage. Yeah. As I said, it's, it's a matter of how specific you want to go. Uh -huh. Because if you are too general you are or too generic, mm -hmm. you are going to have a lot of false alerts, right? Yeah. So um, if we are, for instance, comparing that a new process has been started and we are doing that in... 30 rules, 
-hmm. Well, we just define a macro with the conditions to recognize that a new process has been started. Mm -hmm. And in the Falco rule, we substitute those conditions with the macro. And then we keep adding conditions to make that rule more specific. It's basically reusing code. Uh -huh. Or conditions. Uh, yes. Um... Into a macro. Macro, yep. Uh, for example, a macro might be 10 conditions that uh, must usually, be met to usually run a it's process. like two, three conditions. So it's, I okay. exaggerated a little bit, but yeah, it could, okay. be, could be something like starting a new process or opening a file to, to read its content. So that would make the rule much more readable, easier to maintain. And we could modify that macro and we are modifying a lot of rules at the same time. Okay, to open a file. So now imagine that we have mm -hmm. a condition that compares the name of the process, the name of the binary with mm -hmm. five different shells. Like is the binary bash, is the binary KSH, is the binary SH. So that those are five conditions. We uh -huh. could have them as a macro, uh -huh. but we have something better here. We have a list. Okay. And okay. then what we do is the name of the binary belongs to or is inside this list. And the macro mm -hmm. then becomes much shorter. The rule could also use the list. And that's also a way to simplify the rules. So we have rules, we have macros, and we have lists. I don't quite understand how a list is different from a macro. Will you repeat that, yeah, please? A, a macro is a set of conditions. Yep. But when you use the same condition several times, like the name of the process is A, the name of the process is B, the name of the process is C, you could mm -hmm. say, well, the name of the process belongs to A, B, or C. Ah, uh, I see. So the part where you define A, B, and C, uh -huh. that's a list. And then you simplify the condition again. Okay. So those are the three elements that we have to take into account to understand the Falco rules. Okay, so um... a list is a set of strings, usually, that we are using to compare a condition or to match a condition. Okay. A list is a set of strings or items. Used not sure if all of them are strings. Uh, it could also be another list, for instance. So you could okay. have nested lists. Uh, used to define a condition? Um, to define the possible values of mm -hmm a condition or um, to be compared inside a condition. It's a factorization. Mm -hmm. We're uh, in this, not in general, but in this moment, it, it does feel like we're making it harder than it is, but it is like not. <laughs> right. It's a pretty simple concept that's taking a lot of words, but uh, yeah. it is what it yeah. is. Yeah. So so what I wanted to I wanted to point to the macros and the list are uh, because the default rules include those macros, include those lists. And mm -hmm. otherwise the rules would be huge. 
very difficult to understand and mm -hmm. very difficult to manage. So by having those macros and those lists, we can simplify the management a lot. Like, let's say we have a new process that we want to monitor. Well, the only thing we need to do is to find a rule that monitors those process, those processes for those conditions and extend the list. Or maybe we want to add an exclusion to the macro. So we could uh -huh. extend the macro and then exclude some processes or maybe we don't want to monitor container images we trust. Okay. So macros and lists exist to simplify the rules. The way conditions are, yeah, the rules and the way the conditions are expressed. Mm -hmm. And also to further simplify, you have um, basically templates or like included rules that we're about to the, get to. Yeah, the yeah. the out of the box rules, the included ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Cool. I feel good. Do you feel good? Do you, are you happy with what's written here? Yeah. I'm very happy now. <laughs> <laughs> if I, if, yeah. Don't be shy at all. If you see me writing something that's not quite right, I'd rather be right and be corrected. I'm not, do, I have do, no ego Do I look here. like shy? <laughs> <laughs> touche, touche. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, great. What's next? Um, I don't know. I think you had a question already. We left on post um, mm -hmm. the rules that come out of the, yes. so what we already provide, right? Yes. So those rules are maintained by the community. That means that everyone that is using Falco could write their own rules and could share it mm -hmm. with the community. Since this is an open source project, the moment they contribute the rules, everyone can comment on them can improve the rules and eventually mm -hmm. create a bigger repository. So a few months ago, we had a contribution of 20 rules mm -hmm. on top of those 70. And of course, we need to go through them and see if they are valid and if they are repeated or if they are creating a lot of false positives. And it's a work in progress. So that's the that's one of the benefits of using open source here, right? Yeah, agreed. So there are about 70. They're created and maintained by the community. Mm -hmm. And then you said they're very generic um, earlier? They are generic enough to suit uh -huh. many use cases. Um, as an example, imagine I want to monitor for certain activity, uh -huh. but then my cluster is actually doing a lot of that activity that is fine. I don't want to get alerts when that happens. Yeah. So that user should set some kind of exclude condition to say, OK, mm -hmm. that image, I really trust it. I created it. I don't want uh -huh. to get alerted every time it does that. That looks bad, but it's not. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they might need to tune it. OK. That's, that's what I mean. Of course, the rules uh, should suit should uh, fit your use case. Some people use Falco for compliance. The only thing they want is to know when a file has been modified. They trigger an alert, opens a ticket, and then they have to justify why they modified that file. Mm -hmm. You don't need seventy rules for that. You might work perfectly with three. Uh huh. So. It's just a matter of seeing what is good for you, what is not necessary, because more rules also need more uh, effort that Falco has to mm -hmm. do to filter the the, um, uh, the workloads. Yeah, like more more compute, but also more, more, more processing more time, right? Yeah, processing, and then more human effort in terms of just maintaining it. it yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, do you want to say more about the out-of-the-box Falco rules? There are about 70. They're created and maintained by the community. They're generic enough to fit many use cases, but might need to be tuned. Um, well, the Falco rules can apply to any kind of event. So I've uh -huh. been talking a lot about syscalls, but let's say we include another source of events, like Kubernetes. Uh -huh. 
And then there's another set of rules for that. Uh -huh. That, well, people again can extend. The more people using Kubernetes, using Falco to monitor Kubernetes, could keep extending that set of rules. If I create my new plugin, I would create mm -hmm. my own rules to, to be able to monitor that. But the rules always follow the same syntax, mm -hmm. the same um, condition syntax, the same output. There is a big list of supported event types, supported information that we can provide to the user. And I think that's most that we can say for the rules at the moment. Otherwise, it's going to be overwhelming. <laughs> I think it would be an. It would be interesting to me, at least, to maybe jot down a quick list of all the different, uh, some examples at least of different event types that are supported. Okay, what, so you want the examples of rules, or I was more interested in, in event types themselves. But really, it's your. I want you to express what's so, important about the project. It just. Mm, think that an event type could be a process opening a file which per se is not a threat. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? We can see who the, um, how, many, how, how many permissions, how much powerful that process is. We could compare the name of the process open the, opening the file. We could compare mm -hmm. the name of the file that they want to open. And eventually what we have is an event that someone is trying to open a sensitive file. Someone mm -hmm. is trying to gain privilege. Someone mm -hmm. is trying to change the permissions of a file. Someone is trying mm -hmm. to create um, a configuration where it shouldn't be. Someone mm -hmm. is trying to start a shell in a container and so on and so forth. So, so is this always a person doing a thing? No, it doesn't need to be, it could be automated. Okay. So what we monitor is what the process is doing regarding to the kernel. So if the process has a routine that does this action, uh -huh. we are going to monitor it independently on when it triggers or who triggers that. Because mm -hmm. what we monitor is the behavior, the activity. So the activity is being monitored at the kernel level. For syscalls, yes. That's the basic functioning. OK. Then they said um, so we can we... extend it, but. Mm. System calls, but can't so be extended. Is, this is what we call it runtime monitoring, right? Because it's what happened in the process while it is running. Mm -hmm. If we were checking the process before starting it, it wouldn't be runtime. Mm -hmm. We would be doing any other but, kind of, and there wouldn't be syscalls to monitor because the process is not alive yet. Yeah. So system calls, but can be extended to include what else? You could, you could use the logs from any other application. Mm -hmm. So what the Falco plugin does is it takes the information from a log file or from a log mm -hmm. content, log line, log, log text, and makes it something that the Falco engine can recognize. So okay. where does this come from? What resources is it accessing? Mm -hmm. uh, when did this happen? So all those fields become something parsable and the Falco mm -hmm. engine is able to, to match a set of conditions that make a rule. I tend to call it a grep with superpowers. <laughs> Into, uh... hmm, okay. Well, do I really need that level of information? So, so, okay. so cool. usually, or traditionally, what uh -huh. many cloud or security infrastructures, many CMs have done, was to send the logs to storage. And then they were applying filters there to see if there was something anomalous, right? Uh-huh. 
The problem is from the time something happens to the time where you look for it, maybe four hours happened. Yeah. And then there is no way back. Uh -huh. So you are using bandwidth, you are using storage, and you are yeah. losing time. Yeah. What Falco does is gets the data in the very moment when that happens. Mm -hmm. There is a log in the Kubernetes API that goes to Falco. Falco looks for the, the conditions. Mm -hmm. And if something fits, triggers an alert. And that happens in, what, five seconds. Mm. So we don't need to store the log information unless we consider, mm -hmm. OK, that log information gave me something useful. We can still store it anyway if we want to. But the thing is, we do something we call stream detection. We are detecting in the streaming of data. I like this. And um, I don't, um, depending on what you want to say, I think I would like to, to write how, what, how it used to be so I can understand the problem it's solving. Because that helps me. Like you mm -hmm. can, like you said, it monitors the logs, and I'm like, okay, that's cool, I get it. But then when you tell me the problem it's solving and how it used to be done, then that like helps it resonate more for me as someone who's a newer learner. Yeah, the the problem is what I was defining before. We have a lot mm -hmm. of activity, a lot of containers, a lot of processes that are very difficult to monitor. Mm -hmm. And if we want to do something that scales properly, mm -hmm. we need to look at to look at it from a different perspective. This is where we need this motion sensor, this security camera. And mm -hmm. the best way to do it is to sit on the kernel because every process needs to go through the kernel mm -hmm. to be able to do anything. So we are solving the, the problem of being application specific. Now we don't need to apply security per application, but we apply security at the node level. I like that. And then how does that relate to um, what you were saying about watching logs? Mm -hmm. like plugins watching logs yeah so originally falco was able to detect activity through syscalls but then uh -huh. activity comes from or traces of activity are left in many other places so mm -hmm. when a kubernetes client interacts with a kubernetes cluster and mm -hmm. modifies a, a configuration map for instance Mm -hmm. We cannot monitor that because it happens on the on the machine. There is a, a call in the API, and that's very difficult to, to get. But mm -hmm. there are traces on the logs. Mm -hmm. And Falco Superpower is this filtering engine. So what we do is we transform those logs into something that Falco can process. And the moment we do that, the moment we create a plugin to translate the logs into some, something that Falco understands, then it's we can use Falco to monitor logs in real time. Basically, it's like training Falco to recognize anomalous behavior and detecting it in real time or in runtime. Um, therefore, can detect events, security events, just events. Any kind of event. Maybe maybe we don't want to do security stuff here. Maybe okay. we are. We we remember we are just applying a set of conditions, and if those conditions are match, then we get an alert. Maybe we want to use it to, to monitor the reliability of our application. Could be a use case, why not? So to sum this up, there are two ways that Falco is, is able to detect 
thread events. One is from watching the kernel and two is from this filtering image engine that that works with logs. Um, no, the, the, the um, engine works uh -huh. for everything. What I'm saying is that we have two kind of sources. One source are uh -huh. the kernel events, the kernel systems. Uh -huh. The mm -hmm. other one are the logs mm -hmm. through the Falco plugins. So on the left side, so to say, we would mm -hmm. have the kernel events, we would have Kubernetes, we could have CloudTrail, CloudWatch, my application logs, whatever we want to monitor as an input. In the middle, we could have uh, a kind okay. of translator. OK. I'm sensing, I'm feeling you're you're describing a, <laughs> a diagram. So let's do this. Yes, let's do this. So in the so the main hmm. Well, so to help me picture this, we have inputs, which I'll ac actually ask you to describe to me later. And the middle is a translator, and that translator is being used regardless of whether the input is logs or whether it is um, kernel that stuff. That translator is uh -huh. specific to the kind of to information logs. we receive. What is independent is the the rules engine. Uh -huh. Because the rules engine is going to take something that is already digest digestible by Falco, mm -hmm. and it's going to look at the conditions. So we start from the left. We have mm -hmm. syscalls. OK. And then we have plugins, like a big set. And okay. could be a Kubernetes plugin, could be a CloudTrail plugin, any kind of log plugin. OK. Um, what else besides Kubernetes plugin? What Cloud is what? Uh, will you name some more plugins for me? OK, CloudTrail. CloudTrail. GitHub. GitHub. Cool. And then I'll just put it. Mm -hmm. So these are our sources. Those are possible sources, yeah. Possible sources. Cool. So well, the plugins is not a source per se. The source is actually the Kubernetes audit logs. In CloudTrail, CloudTrail is the source, and then we have a CloudTrail plugin. So can we move the syscalls a little bit more to the left? <laughs> and then we can stay. Or just put it down if you want. Then we don't have to move the plugins. So possible, just move it down here? Yeah. Uh, on the left, more on the left, because uh, there is another component there I will Mention in a moment. Love it. I like this. This is it's like a all right. So uh -huh. now the question is: We already know how to get information from Kubernetes, from CloudTrail, from GitHub. We just need a piece of software that is able to take a text file and transform it into something that we can parse. Mm -hmm. How do we get the syscalls? That's the tricky part. Mm -hmm. For that we need to tap into the kernel. OK. And we have two ways of doing that. Uh -huh. A kernel module uh -huh. or using eBPF. Oh. We don't need both. We could have either the module or eBPF, depending on the environment, depending on our needs. And that would be, that would be like the equivalent to the plugin for the syscalls. Excellent. Move this down. We, um, so eBPF is like a sandbox for the Linux kernel, right? Yeah. 
So what we do is we instrumentalize the kernel mm -hmm. and we add some functionality. So Falco doesn't need to be invasive when it comes to monitor kernel activity. So what happens there is that every syscall is sent into a buffer. The buffer is processed by a library and then we got the parser. So what comes after this? It comes the Falco libraries. The Falco okay. libraries receive the information from the plugins for the kernel module, for eBPF, you name it. Mm -hmm. And then it processes, it, it extracts the information. Uh... Would be process, would be parsing. Receiving info from, mm -hmm. I guess, the sources. Yeah. OK. And then what to do? Uh, what they do is they extract that information mm -hmm. and they pass it to the next stage, also from the kernel module. So the, the beauty of this is that it doesn't matter what you plug on the left. Mm -hmm. The Falco libraries are going to translate it into something that the Falco engine can use to apply the rules. Cool. I love this. All right. So that's the Falco libraries. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then the next stage would be the Falco engine. Falco engine. Or the rules engine, we call it. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can call we'll it, call rules it the, engine. the Falco rules engine. Uh -huh. <laughs> Got it. Is there going to be another one? No, uh, maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right. I can keep it growing. It. <laughs> <laughs> <We're> just... <laughs> okay. I'll try to make the next one smaller. Yeah. So, what is this going to do? This uh -huh. is loading the Falco rules. Uh huh. And it's going to compare the information that comes from the library with the rules. In a nutshell. So this is Falco, or this is the, the basic architecture. Oh, excellent. And then, yeah. and so basically, if we add another thing, what it's outputting is an alert if, if necessary, possibly an alert if, if the alert on anomaly. So the thing is, you could send the alerts to the Linux journaling system mm -hmm. to syslog. You could send it to Elastic. You could send it to many different um, technologies. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we have a small project called Falco Sidekick. Mm -hmm. And Falco Sidekick takes the output and it forwards it. It's like a proxy to whatever you want. So maybe it's Splunk, maybe ELK, maybe um, a central CM, a Lux repository. And this is a side project. That's not part of the okay. part of functionality. Well, it's useful okay. when you want to integrate Falco to your infrastructure because you uh -huh. can you can obtain that information instead of just leaving it on the node and someone has to pick it up. So.
Okay. Falco sidekick, and then I'm just going to write optional side project. And, and we repeat what it does in a way that I can write here. Mm -hmm. It forwards the alert mm -hmm. into um, Ooh, I the desire system. I'm going to, I have a, I have a, a vision. Thank you for your patience. So what I want is to write alerts. Mm -hmm. Yep. And of course it's not alerting on everything, but if alerts happen, they happen here. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna do a Falco sidekick. I love this diagram. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> Optional side project. Actually, never tried then, to, to, dry, to draw a, a diagram of giving instructions. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, it's more complicated then. <laughs> then. <laughs> Hello, Code with Sean. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, friend. Hey, hey, hey. Um, will you tell me a third time and the final time what's right here for Falco Sidekick? So it forwards the alerts. Okay. To any existing infrastructure or um, any compatible destination. Yeah, I know. Sounds very boring. <laughs> no, 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 it's not boring. I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna write compatible destinations, and then we'll we'll put a couple of examples. Yeah, it supports like uh, 50, 60 different systems. So you wow. could send it to a Slack channel. You could send it to, um, well, messaging Telegram. Uh, and then there is another project coming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, 50, 60. But it's uh, still quite uh, young. Okay. I want to denote the past, like that this is a left to right diagram or like that as it moves through, it's going this way. Am I still on this board at the watch? Yeah, uh, I went off the edge there. That's okay. I'm the boss of this thing. It's not the other way around. So I'll just put lots of triangles in to represent. Although I'm not doing the best job at draw, drawing triangles under pressure. Okay, now where are we going to tell me about this last project and we'll think about how to fit it in. So um, I said before, Falco is a thread detector. Uh huh. And so far, this is what this diagram describes. We yes. get a source of events and we detect uh -huh. threads. Now yeah. the question is, what do we do with them? Yes. Well, what Falco does, does is alerts, nothing else. Uh -huh. yeah. So many users would like to be able to react, to respond to those threats. Yes. They would yeah. like to have some kind of control. Let's say I want to kill the container. I want to um, block the connection, whatever. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need mm -hmm. to be able to evaluate the information you get, the alert, mm -hmm. and have some kind of functionality. So this new project is called Falco Talon. Is um, it's so what it does is it takes the alert, and mm -hmm. you can associate a function to it. So it could go back to the source of the event and say, well. Now that you behave in a bad manner, I'm going mm -hmm. to, to kill you. 
In, in, in a system way, in a system, <laughs> <laughs> metaphorical way, right? <laughs> uh, so Falco Talon, and it's it's a new side project, a side mm -hmm. project that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it would be like the continuation of Falco Sidekick, and well, it could kill the um, the suspicious container process. It. Yep. So it takes action on alerts is the exactly. bottom line. It's, it's the response part of the whole life cycle of the alert. OK. Oops, I didn't mean to cross it out. That's OK. Takes action on alerts. And then maybe examples. Um, kill so the process, kill the container. Kill the container could be an example. It could also be a starting a, a more detailed monitoring. Maybe you want to not to kill the process, but to know what they are doing. And you could start capturing the information. So if you remember at the beginning where we were talking about Cystic, Cystic has a functionality that is able to capture what happens in the system mm -hmm. for a number of seconds, like TCP done, that's with the network. So maybe what we want is to start Cystic in the background, keep it running for half a minute, and then stop it. And then okay. We know, okay, this is what the, the event was trying to do. That would be an example, right? So kind of responding to the event in a manner that we can control. Of course, cool. it doesn't need to be in the in our work, workflow. Maybe the user wants to have something more customized. Maybe want, they want to use lambdas, or they want to use their own containers. Uh -huh. the, the thing is, Falco Sidekick will send the alert and then it's not Falco's problem anymore. You can uh -huh. treat it as you want. But Falco Talon gives you that functionality. That makes sense. I, I can see how people would want that. Amazing. We still I have really some space left. We do. Do you have something <laughs> to say? Uh, well, it depends on which direction now. What are, what are the choices? We have a, a, a strong arm comments. Hello, hello, welcome. We're doing it. Do we have any question? Yeah. People are... It's it's people are saying hello, but not a lot of questions. No today. questions so far. Well. Yeah. All right. So we talked about the origins of Falco. We talked about how it works, monitoring uh -huh. Cisco, the the plugins infrastructure that came out like two, three releases ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we have talked about the Falco rules, mm -hmm. an important topic. Um, the output that was mentioned with Falco Sidekick, how we can control mm -hmm. where we want to send it. Mm -hmm. I'm writing mm -hmm. about the rules being too loose. Too loose can mean bad stuff gets through. So maybe do you have advice for how to find the, the sweet the sweet spot of the rules? Um, as I said, that depends a lot on the workloads of the user. So uh -huh. I would say the best way is to let it run, see which alerts you are getting, and then you realize what you want to tune. Mostly mm -hmm. tune down. Of course, it's very difficult to to avoid false negatives because you don't mm -hmm. see them. But when you see false positives, you have to recognize that maybe you have something that hasn't been contemplated by Falco and you have it run it in a regular way and you are getting a lot of alerts. Another thing to take into account is how much resources you want to give to Falco. So by default, we configure Falco to run on each node. So if you have a Kubernetes cluster, what we uh -huh. do is we deploy Falco as a daemon set. 
And okay. then we make sure that we are monitoring every kernel. But if you want to monitor Kubernetes or you want to monitor CloudTrail, maybe mm -hmm. you want to monitor GitHub, sounds mm -hmm. a bit weird. Why, why would they want to monitor GitHub? Well, sometimes mm -hmm. people share secrets, uh, upload secrets, and do things that they shouldn't do, like well, log Yeah, and GitOps, GitHub becomes your source of truth. So I, I, exactly. I absolutely can see why you would want to. Yeah. So they, Falco has a plugin to monitor the GitHub logs, and well, I'll alert you on that. So what I was saying uh -huh. is that you want to deploy it depending on what you want to use. If you want to mm -hmm. monitor GitHub, you don't need one instance per node. You need one, uh -huh. maybe two instances. If you want to monitor syscalls, then it's when you need one instance per node. So you might have two or more deployments of Falco depending on your needs. It's also possible that you have Falco deployed on cloud vendors, let's say on AWS or in Google or in Azure. So uh -huh. you also need to take into account that kind of architecture. It's not the same to monitor a Kubernetes cluster than monitoring a Lambda server. We so, had, we yeah. had a, a recent integration, um, it was a couple of months ago. It was with Google Divisor. Divisor is a very nice technology that isolates a container even more. So what it does is it creates an application kernel. And that means that the container running on top of Divisor uh -huh is not accessing the kernel directly, but through the divisor contain the three divisor divisor kernel. Uh -huh. And then Fargo wasn't able to say what was happening there because it was like, oh. yeah, everything goes through divisor. So I cannot tell you who did that. Yeah. And we integrated to obtain information directly from divisor. So we uh -huh. can give you a more accurate state of what is happening and the Falco the Falco rules were much better than before. So that kind of integrations are things that have been happening in the latest releases. The okay. device one is a very, very nice one. Um, OK, let me, uh, let me make sure I'm capturing. I'm a little bit behind you. So um, Falco might be deployed on Kubernetes as a daemon set, and then on GitHub as how? No, we wouldn't deploy. Falco on the GitHub, we would deploy okay. it on maybe on Kubernetes, but okay. to monitor GitHub or maybe on a bare metal machine. Falco can be deployed okay. anywhere. So Falco can monitor mm -hmm. Kubernetes, GitHub, cloud provider. CloudWatch, for instance, I said it was um, CloudWatch. You CloudWatch, CloudTrail. I said cloud trail. Cloud trail. Uh, yeah, cloud I, do, I don't know either of those technologies. Well, cloud AWS watch. send the logs of whatever happens in the in environment uh, to cloud trail. And then what we do is we um, consume the events so you can apply the rules on them. OK. Uh, OK. So. And then what's the one you said that, that's new that you're happy with? Uh, divisor. T, like T G, visor, like Google, Google visor. Oh, G visor. Got it. Got it. Any other mentional ones we should mention? Mm. I'm gonna do cloud trail. From the top of my mind, I guess eight uh, bare metal. Mm, well, if you deploy it on a virtual machine or bare metal, you are just mm -hmm. losing the capability of recognizing what happens in a container because mm -hmm. you don't have containers. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> obvious, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, we, we say it's a cloud-native technology because it tells you in which container the so, events happen. 
so Falco, so that's maybe worth putting over here. Like it's basically for containers. No, yeah? it's not. No, that's oh, that's okay. what then I wanted I to say. Yeah. It works very well with containers because it uh -huh. shares the metadata of the containers with the engine. So uh -huh. Falco is constantly monitoring what happens in the system. And uh -huh. when there is a new container created, it uh -huh. enriches the state. It looks for metadata information like the name of the container, the name of the pod, the host where that container is running. And then it's much easier for the user to say, hey, the container is trying to spin up a shell. If uh -huh. I told you there is an Nginx process somewhere that tries to open a shell, it's, OK, how uh -huh. do I look for that? It's very oh, difficult. Yeah. But uh -huh. if you run it on a traditional Linux machine, bare metal, virtual machine, whatever, it's going to work the same way. It's just you don't have container information because there are no containers. Uh huh. Got you. I see. So. Um, oh, Nomad. Like That's if... another plugin that uh, Fargo can use. Okay. Okay. Nomad. Are are all of these plugins? Um, everything. Well, Divisor is not a plugin. That's something in the Falco libraries, okay. and the syscalls they don't work as a plugin at the moment. That's integrated in the in the architecture and design. Okay. But the rest, yeah. yeah, we didn't have that written here. I'll write syscall. I'm gonna write. Cool. Excellent. We're doing it. We have just a little bit left. So um, when I, one thing that's nice to do with about this much space left, if you want, is to kind of recap what the benefits are of Falco. Mm -hmm. Or we can in introduce brand new information. That is up to you. I think we already have a lot of information. <laughs> we do. I like that about us. Yeah. So you go with some benefits. Yeah, some some benefits cool. are are good. So one one benefit that we have is that it doesn't matter how big our infrastructure is, mm -hmm. Falco is going to monitor it all at the same. I mean, mm. whatever is happens. That, yeah. Could you say it scales well? It scales well. Okay. So that is something horizontally. I'm... Yeah, so when I say horizontally is because it doesn't matter the number of nodes you have. You are uh -huh. going to monitor those nodes in the same way because Falco is running we could say as an agent. So you would have a Falco instance on each node. Mm hmm Let's talk uh, related to Kubernetes, like it running as a daemon set. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, if you deploy it in a traditional cluster, one of those I was mentioning before, 15 years yeah. ago, <laughs> you could deploy it yeah. with Ansible, with Puppet, and it would do the same. You just need to configure uh -huh. to install the package, configure to maybe send it to another Falco Sidekick instance, and then uh -huh. you can do whatever you want. So it can up can be applied to traditional infrastructure. So it scales well horizontally. Mm -hmm. I like that. What else? The... I, have, I have a question, which I think maybe that. Uh, Go ahead. It seems to me with this and um, just maybe with like runtime alerting in general, that it might take a lot of compute to be able to watch every single thing that's ever happening. Well, ever Falco, in the cluster. Yeah. When we when we talk about Cisco's and uh -huh. we talk about what happens inside the clusters, uh -huh. the portion that happens in the CPU is very uh -huh. light. So what we do is uh -huh. we send the data to a buffer and then uh -huh. the engine is taking care of it. Okay. So we we are not collapsing the CPU. Okay. And if there is a moment when Falco cannot process at the speed that it should. What it uh -huh. does is 
it forgets about the calls. It drops the call and say, well, that's too much work for me. I cannot uh -huh. hold that much. Uh -huh. It has to be fine-tuned to say, well, you need a bigger buffer or you need okay. more CPU resources. But at the moment, Falco is side-threaded. That means it's never going to consume more than one CPU per node. Okay. So, so, so would it be correct in the benefits to write light footprint? Yeah. Cool. Keeps improving because the technology also improves, right? So we mentioned mm -hmm. eBPF, yeah. and now there is a, a new version of the eBPF driver that means it doesn't have to be compiled for the specific machine where it's running. So it can be mm -hmm. compiled once and run everywhere and adds more functionality that new kernel support. So every new release works better than the one before. Mm -hmm. Yes, cool. What else we got? Uh, we have an amazing community. Oh, so yes. we have more than 20, now maybe I'm ex, uh, but there are between 15 and 20 maintainers. And we uh -huh. have um, a lot of contributions. So at the moment, we are CNCF incubating project. We are mm -hmm. trying to graduate. We want to show that we are a mature project. And well, we have a lot of contributions for, from companies like IBM or Dell or Red Hat, um, and even some names I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't name. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, some uh, people don't want, don't want the company to be named very publicly, so. <laughs> Yes, yes, I'm familiar. But if you go to the logs, they, they all stay there. So everything is eventually public. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Cool. Um, what we did it, we kind of said it's small, it's kind of buried in here. But one thing I feel like we should draw attention to is like, the whole point is these alerts. I mean, there's, they're getting to be more points than just the alerts, but it was created. It seems like the alerting is important. And I feel like maybe, I'm not sure we captured. Okay, like maybe, maybe I, didn't, I didn't give too much information there because uh -huh. an alert looks like a regular text line. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. the power of it is that we define the text and we define what information is going to be shared there. So... Uh -huh. The moment an alert happens, we mm -hmm. could share the name of the process. We could share the node where it happened, the container, the specific container where it happened. Mm -hmm. We could share from which IP address a specific connection came from, mm -hmm. or we could, um, well, we could we could print so much information regarding the state as we have, mm -hmm. and this is just a template. So the mm -hmm. same events we use for the conditions can be mm -hmm. printed in the alert. Mm -hmm. so the conditions are powerful, the alerts as well, but eventually it's just text. Do it simple, do it good. Yeah, 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 I like that. So maybe, um, maybe that's even a benefit is like, there's a lot of built-in functionality, but it's also highly customizable. Um, well, the Falco rules are very well recognized in the community. So the uh -huh. moment there's a new project that tries to do some detection, mm -hmm. they usually refer to the Falco alerts. There are mm -hmm. some projects that even mention they are going to create a Falco rules translator. Because mm -hmm. when you when you get a, a project out in, in some months, you need some base, you need some rules. And this is not mm -hmm. something you create in in three months. Yeah. The FICO rules have been growing for five years. And as yeah. I tell you, we only have 70 of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, well, that, adds, takes... that gives me even more context for that statement you made earlier that 20 additional rules just got added all at once. Yeah. That's a lot. That's, That's a, oh, lot, yeah. uh, a lot of work to, to bet them to make sure they are not breaking anything. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that's 
it's really something to be appreciated from the community here. Cool. So, so then I do think those, um, that is a powerful benefit that you would have access to these rules that have been developed by the community. Yeah. So every such- rule is an example of how to write your own rule. Uh-huh. So what we recommend is observe your workload. You could use tools like Strace or maybe Cystic Open Source, and then mm-hmm. find the filter that really makes your, your alert trigger. Once you mm-hmm. have the filter, you can write the condition and the race is just uh, metadata, yes. Um, another another advantage of the rule is that they are written in YAML format. It means mm. we have um, the typical list with the fields, the name, colon, and the ID, the mm-hmm. condition, colon, and the set of filters, and so on. So the rules are human readable. Can, they are easily understood thanks to the usage of macros and lists. So when you say that a rule says uh, spawn process and process belongs to shell list, it mm-hmm. sounds like human language, but thanks to uh-huh. using macros and using list, the condition is not uh, it can equal, be very if not. <laughs> uh-huh. Like it could be very complex, but then uh, pretty easily understood. It can be complex inside, human. but um, mm-hmm. yeah, when you see the rule that has been triggered, is not uh, that that bad. Uh, I forgot to mention that Falco is also part of the Linux Foundation CKS training. So the CKS, the Certificate of Kubernetes Specialist, Security Specialist, is the um, is the collection of tools that an engineer needs to harden and secure a Kubernetes cluster. So there are many, yeah, CKS. So the CKS, okay, security is, specialist. Is the, is the younger brother of the CKA. Okay. So CKA is based on architecting a Kubernetes configuration, CKAD mm-hmm. for developers and CKS for hardening the cluster. So in the, in the program, they teach you how to use Kubernetes, how to install it, how to set the rules, and many other benefits from it. It's it's a great way of making sure that runtime security is fulfilled in the in the cluster. Cool. So uh I mean, uh, one thing we talked about that we could put on the benefits is maybe that it's like, extensible. Because of the plugins? Or you mean plugins. on the other side? The thing is, it integrates on the left side with the plugins, on the right side uh-huh. with Falco Sidekick. So you, uh-huh. can, you can integrate with a, a very varied set of systems. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'll write. Um, With many, many systems. That's a very technical way to put that. I'm I'm not a technical person when it comes to to throwing buzzwords. I, I <laughs> oh, like yeah. to keep it simple and try to uh-huh. accessible. Keep it accessible. I agree. Um, well, do you have anything you want to add? I'm feeling pretty wonderful. Um I was expecting some questions, but uh, maybe mm-hmm. the people were overwhelmed. <laughs> 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 Everything was clear, Scott. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's a little quiet today yeah, in the but chat, but that's it, okay. That's okay. It really represents very well the the function in an architecture Falco. Mm. But I'm I you, I don't like forgetting that. Uh, we are constantly looking for contributors. This is oh, something absolutely. that happens in many CNCF projects. Mm-hmm. And well, this is a community supported project. So if people want to contribute, they should really come to the community calls or join the Slack channel. Even if they have never tried it, they can discover a lot from, from it. And well, we are 
we're trying to evangelize people and make them discover that security doesn't end when you have secured your system. Uh -huh. It continues monitoring. There is, yeah. there is always something that could go wrong. And Falco is the right to, to, to recognize something that you don't want to happen in your cluster. Well, if you're if you're a good indicator, then the the community is surely very kind and welcoming and accessible. Um, some projects have told me lately that they've been getting in, involved with a Linux Foundation mentoring um, mm -hmm. opportunity. So I don't know if y'all do that, but it seems to be working well. Yeah, we we have been working with them too. Yeah, cool. Um, with with Google as well. Definitely. Excellent. Oh, wonderful. Um, I, I, before we say goodbye, what I want to do is recap everything we've written down to make sure the understanding everything. is clear. Yeah, yeah, it only <laughs> sounds so bad. <laughs> do you need to get going so you can start cooking your dinner and eat in four hours? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, we're going to do this recap and then we'll say our goodbyes. And if anyone has any questions, now's a great time. So before Falco, um, there were tools that existed to watch different parts of your system, but they were disparate. So there was, um, you could monitor like which files were opened or, or which op files are open. You could monitor system calls, you could monitor network traffic, but these were all separate things. So a single tool, not Falco, but Sysdig was created to do all of those things. So then you can do troubleshooting and monitoring from one place and you can uh, use those statistics in, uh, uh, in tandem with each other. So you're keeping track of your, the state and the context of what's happening. And also as part of this tool, um, you can create and use filters. So the problem though is that it's a very interactive system and it was a very high touch system to high maintenance to be able to watch all of these things. So Falco was created to run in the background as a daemon and then automate the way these filters are applied for um, common runtime security issues. So Falco still does use those libraries that were once created for Sysdig, but they're now called Falco libraries and they're donated to the CNCF. So this is the most simple yet I've had for a definition of a, of a, a CNCF project, which is Falco is a cloud native threat detector and you even added the qualifier that it doesn't have to be cloud native. So, so then it's like Falco is a threat detector. Um, but what it, it, it inputs conditions, which we'll talk more about later, and it outputs alerts. We should maybe even write that down because that's uh, a nice simple way to say that, right? Um, so you had a, a wonderful analogy that just made my mind uh, light up with it was so lovely so it imagine an amusement park and so it's a very complex situation with a lot of different things going on and falco is like security cameras that are watching everything and that can detect anomalies and alert so we talked about um what is a threat a threat is an event that can endanger a system and then what we mean from falco is uh to do with Falco is define a rule that recognizes a threat event and then triggers an alert. So if you make your rules too loose, bad stuff gets through or you get lots of false positives. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No false. Yeah. Okay. False not positives and negatives. I'm getting switched in my head right now. Or if they're too strict, there's so many alerts or false negatives. Um, so Basically, a Falco rule is that rule that recognizes a, a threat event and triggered as an alert. So there are lots of fields in a Falco rule. Um, you would do a name, which is the ID. There are conditions, which we'll talk more about. There's an output, like what you want the output to be, which is a text. Uh, that alert in the end is just a text you said. Um, the priority, like so you could specify how bad of a threat is this. And then um, a description of what, what the rule is. And then there's plenty more optional stuff you could put in there when you're defining your rule. So the number of the conditions in a Falco rule can be very, very large. And so when that happens, and they can be grouped into a macro. So a macro might have several conditions. We said two or three conditions that are met. So one um, 
So we said like to open a file, you can make a macro that's about opening a file and it will contain two or three conditions. And then there's another abstraction called a list that's a set of items, for example, strings that are used to define the possible values to be compared inside a condition. And that's just a complex way of saying, uh, of being like, instead of saying, um, watch process A, watch process B, watch process C, you could say, watch processes A, B, and C. Uh, that makes it harder than it seems like it needs to be. <laughs> That's okay, we can still, we understand. <laughs> um, so then we have some FACL rules that come out of the box. And what you said later is that these, they're about 70, there are more always being added, but it took five years even to come up for the community to come up with these 70. So they're very, um, well fleshed out rules. So these rules are created and maintained by the Falco community. And then they're generic enough to fit many use cases, but they might need to be tuned when implemented. So we said, um, we talked about these security events again, and what are some event types? So event types could be a person opening a file, config being created, permission being changed, system calls. Um, System calls are what the core Falco functionality includes, but those can be extended with Falco plugins. And the Falco plugins use um, logs of different systems, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. But with the plugins, um, and, and between the plugins and the system calls, we'll say Falco can monitor a lot of different things besides your actual system it could be like kubernetes but also github or your cloud providers nomad cloudwatch gvisor some of these i'm going to be looking up later because i don't know them cloud trail and then of course those system calls so in for example in kubernetes falco is deployed as a daemon set like one per node so basically there are many many processes and it's hard to monitor them all so we drew out this diagram for about how it works. And so there are different sources. So there are the system calls that we talked about, and that can be either get gotten from the kernel module or now um, with eBPF, which eBPF has a couple of benefits. Um, one is that it's performance, and the other is that you don't have to, um, it's less dangerous than getting straight into the, the, the kernel. And so those are how you could do it with system calls, but you can also do it with the aforementioned plugin. So Kubernetes plugin, CloudTrail plugin, GitHub plugin, et cetera. So all those sources then go to the Falco library. So the Falco library is receiving information from these sources It extracts what it needs and it translates it into a language that it understands. And once it's in the language that Falco likes, then Falco uses their rules the rules engine. So then it loads the Falco rules and then it compares this information that originally came from the sources translated by the libraries. It compares that information to the rules. And that's when, if there's any um, anomaly, anything it triggered, that's when the alerts happen. And now we have two. So traditionally Falco has been all about yeah. alerting but now the, the community is moving into a direction where they want to do something with the alerts. So we have a couple of side projects we talked about. The first one is side, uh, Falco Sidekicks. So at once an alert happens, it can forward that alert to compatible destinations. So you mentioned like a Slack channel or Telegram messages, um, but there are like 50 or 60 of them. So there are a lot of different places it can go. And then we also talked about another experimental feature, another new project called uh, Falco Talon. I like that name. Um, and so it can actually take action on alerts. So it might kill the container if something's a problem or it might uh, trigger, it might start capturing additional information if a certain anomaly is detected. And that's that, Falco's a cloud native threat detector. It's a I threat impressed. detector. I mean, yeah. how, you might, how, how you, could you capture so much information? <laughs> <laughs> it takes two. I'm impressed by you. Like, you have to be wonderful and so if, for me to be able to do my thing. It's a team. Great work. So, definitely. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. I appreciate you. My pleasure. If, yeah. Is there anything you want to say in closing? Um,
I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> good. It, seems like it was a great good. time. It was really, really good. fun working with you. So um, to close out, I'm going to replay the intro music and we're just going to dance a little bit and say goodbye. So how do you feel about that? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Thank you. Uh, let me get this music going. Here we are. Yay. Thank you, Vicente. I appreciate you. I hope we get to cook curry together someday. I'll do it. <laughs>